in your presence oh God we, we have all we need that's why we're calling upon on your name oh God
church say we know there is more that's found in you it's in conviction that everything I need is in you, O oh Lord. We find it in you. Well, hi, New Love Covenant Church and our viewers around the world. Just a real heads up and thank you to everybody for your support. There are so many individuals around the world that have lost loved ones. Uh, our condolences to you and again from Pastor Chichen, I thank you for your phenomenal support around our, the passing of our son Bernie. For Zimbabweans this is a, a significant weekend and holiday. It's a Heroes and Defense Forces Day. We want to remember what uh, was done in the past, the lives that were given for an independent Zimbabwe and may everybody be safe and enjoy the peace that we enjoy in this country. We'll see you next week. We want to thank all the presenters that are presenting every week. May God richly bless you, and may God reward all of you for the seeds you sow. Enjoy. Well, a very good morning, and thank you so much for being with us. I want to start by acknowledging and greeting Bishop and Ma. Um, of course, we continue to carry both of you as well as the, the broader family, Jean and Tari, Jason, Tadi, TJ, LaShawn, and Granny V, and the entire Bismarck and Vahakis family as we are in the season um, of, of mourning, and we continue to pray for God strengthening in you. We greet all of you at New Life Covenant Church in Harare, and we are honored to be able to minister to you. I bring you greetings from Pastor Va our family, as well as the congregation here in Blayo. May God bless you as we partake of this um, service together. This morning, for a few moments, I want to speak to us on a subject I've simply titled, Here Come the Dreamers. Here Come the Dreamers. I'm going to take three portions of reading, three portions of scripture for our reading this morning. I'm um, reading out of the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verses 18 to 20. And then out of Psalm 105, verses 17 to 23, and then 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. Genesis 37, 18 to 20 reads, When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made, a, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We, will, we can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we will see what becomes of his dreams. Psalm 105, verses 17 through 23, and I'm, all my readings are out of the New Living Translation. Verse 17 says, Then he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in, iron in an iron collar. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door. Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler over all the king's possessions. He could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisors. Then Israel arrived in Egypt. Jacob lived as a foreigner in the land of Ham. Finally, I read out of um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11, uh, 1 through 10. This boasting will do me no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was, cast, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up 
to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is, is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weakness. If I wanted to boast, I would, not, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming humble. Three times, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad about, I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May God bless us all by the reading of his word. And so this morning as we begin, I just ask that, Father, you grant us grace and enable us to speak, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my God, and my Redeemer. Amen. And so when we begin to talk about Here Comes the Dreamer, the context of that aspect for me is the, the, the idea that the kingdom of God represents the dream of God for his people. And so when we preach and when we talk about the kingdom, in truth, we are talking about something that is a dream to the people around us. By way of context, in February of 1968, Andrew Warhol's uh, retrospective exhibition catalog contained in their statement that said that in the future, everybody will be famous, will be world famous for 15 minutes. And the idea of, of, of this, the reason I pick up on this is because we are living in a generation that's, that's caught up in, 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 in the idea of being famous and popular. We are possibly the first generation in the human family that got people that are famous just for being famous, famous for having certain body parts, famous for having the right number of um, shares, likes, or follows on social media platforms. And because of that, it's possible to become caught up and want to live in a single moment moment as if it's the totality of an expression. And so reality TV and that popular culture becomes a strong influence. And yet the kingdom of God calls us to more than just a single moment. We have to be aware that we are living for more than just 15 minutes of fame. And so the kingdom of God is aspirational and inspirational and is constantly contending for an actual manifestation. It is aspirational because it is at a level higher than most of us live. It is, it is inspirational because it puts within us the spirit of God to aspire to what God has uh, called us into. And it demands an actual manifestation because throughout scripture we find the narrative that we must taste and see that the Lord is good. And so when we speak on the spectrum of human need, if you take Maslow's hierarchy of, of human needs, starting from biological to social and emotional and then going all the way up, you find that when the kingdom of God enters into the human family, the kingdom of God is calling all of us to the highest level, which would be self-actualization. This, of course, is contrary to a world culture that's seeking and motivating and pushing us to satisfy the lower level needs. The problem with the satisfaction of lower level needs is that we become caught up in conversations around costs of living and uh, standards of living, which in themselves can be compartmentalized. So the standard of living can be judged by what people drive, what people wear, what people eat, and where people live. The cost of living is then an aggregate of what it costs to put all of that together. And it's easy for human and world systems to 
to measure us as people in accordance with that standard. When we come to the kingdom of God, however, the concern is for a quality of life. Quality of life is holistic. It, it embraces the totality of the human experience. So it's not just about the how and the what we are living. It's about the why and, 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 and the nature of that, of that um, living experience. And so when you deal with, with world systems that are constantly looking for costs and standards of living, they can easily compartmentalize and based on what is external, they judge and say that people are doing okay. And so on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you find that when the offer is to satisfy the biological needs, the challenge is that we get human beings caught up in what we call carnal appetites because then we become appetite driven that when people are accustomed to living in a certain way. The more they earn, instead of reaching for greater goals, they can easily change up their appetites. The, 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 the appetite in meat moves from offals to certain cuts and certain uh, sources of, 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 of this meat and, and, and where it comes from. And the pursuits become very uh, mundane in their nature. And so we find that John writes to us and warns us in 3 John that in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, all of which are typically at a very uh, carnal, very appetite-driven level. We find that in the life of David, for instance. He, when he had attained the greatness of what the kingdom was calling him to be, got caught up in a moment of weakness, and in that moment of weakness, he, in, he experienced the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, uh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all in a single season that almost cost him the kingdom. And so, if we take a detour from there now and begin to consider what it is that we are pushing toward. When world rulers, the, the, the princes and principalities, as well as our natural governments, cannot, typically they cannot conceive of a holistic prosperity, um, and thus they formulate policies and philosophies, even religious doctrines um, that promote materialism and consumerism to try and placate the inner yearning um, of, of, of people, even though God has a higher calling on our lives. And so as a result, world systems are crafted to contain and conform people um, to this pattern. That's why Paul says that do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so much like the children of Israel, people are conditioned, as Pharaoh did with the children of Israel when he dealt shrewdly with them in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, sorry. In the book of Exodus, Pharaoh deals shrewdly with the children of Israel, and what he did was systematically cut off a generation of sons. When he did that, he was able to execute that plan by oppressing their fathers, putting them under heavy labor, and when they were under heavy labor, they exposed their children because they weren't on the home front to defend their children, and when the mothers lost those children, they were broken. And as a people, collectively, they experienced a collective loss and a collective grief that broke their spirit to the point where they began to question or even forget the promises of God that he had made to them as a people that went down into Egypt uh, as partakers of the promise of Abraham. And so the trauma of that loss broke the spirit of the people and silenced God's promises in their lives. When Jochebed, when Jochebed, the mother of Miriam and Aaron and, uh, and Moses, comes along, she then speaks to Moses in that period while she was nursing him for Pharaoh's daughter. She speaks to Moses and reminds him of the promises so that when he is a grown man and he goes out among his people and sees their suffering, on the one day he tries to bring deliverance to them by killing a, a, an Egyptian. And then the next day when he went and saw two Israelites fighting in his mind because of what he had been told, he is thinking at an aspirational level for the deliverance and the fulfillment of his people. And yet the people he was trying to bring deliverance to could not believe or think at the same level as him. And so despite or because of their dire circumstances, justice, unity, and mutual dignity were not concepts 
that they attained toward. They were rather overridden by the need to survive and gain the approval of the system that was, that was forcing them into conformity. And so Moses, even though he's a deliverer, finds himself at war and in an antagonistic position with the people he's trying to bring deliverance to. Because when you are pursuing the promises of God, many times, even the people you are trying to help are so caught up and wrapped up in the dysfunction of this world that they can't see what you are offering. And what you are offering, what we offer from the kingdom is, is, is as a dream to them. And so the circumstances of Moses' birth, his preservation and nurturing were all designed to, to, to make him a nonconformist. Everything he went through was shaped in such a way, orchestrated in such a way that he could not conform to the Egyptian pattern of what was going on around him. And many times you and I feel out of place in the places where we are, in our workplaces, in our schools, even in our own families. We feel out of place because the conversations, the exposures, and the things that God has put in our spirits make us nonconformist to the world around us. So we find that all of these things predisposed Moses to, to, to aspire to a higher ideal than the rest of the people. For the rest of the people, they were quite content to just leave Egypt physically. But they weren't content to deal with what Moses was processing in conversations with God, where God is speaking to him concerning laws and precepts and ordinances that would order and change their way and circumstance of life. And so we now come to the seasons in which dreams are released. There are three, in my mind, or just for the purposes of this presentation, uh, three seasons in which dreams are released. Firstly, there's seasons of restlessness. Uh, these can sometimes lead to, to nightmares where uh, Job speaks in, in chapter 33, uh, verses 14 to 16. He says, for God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. He speaks in dreams and visions of the night when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds. He whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings, which signifies that these are moments where even though the body may be seeking to rest, the mind hasn't rested. And so you wake up, you're still tired. You wake up, there's anxieties and, and, and things of the sort because those are seasons of restlessness. We pray that those would not be the dreams that characterize our lives. The second season of dreams is a season in the night again of rest. It's in a season of rest where much like the whole world is in this global pandemic now, it feels unnatural. It feels uncomfortable for us as human beings to be shut off and suspended from our normal normal social and, 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 and uh, business activities, and yet it's a season in which God could be speaking to the world collectively and his church in particular and saying to us, rest and think and consider. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 5, Verses 3 and 7, he says there, for, in a, for a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by many words. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there is also vanity, but fear God. And so the idea is that in all the trying to catch up, in all the trying to make a plan of this season, we have to be mindful that God in this night season of the earth could be speaking to us and is speaking to us. We heard Bishop say in the month of April that he saw God press the reset button. That should signify to us that God is setting up a new order. And we have to be mindful and thinking, what could that order be? What could God calling us to? Surely we don't go through a reset to go back to what we were before. And so we come to the third season of dreams. The third season of dreams to my mind is the season of transcendence where God calls Abraham. He puts him into a deep sleep because Abraham is concerned again by the, by the notion that you haven't given me an heir, you haven't given me a biological son and God speaks to him and says, let me take you out of the tent, out of your area of confinement, confinement, out of your space of limitation and show you the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore but let me speak to you concerning things that are
are yet to come. And in that deep sleep, God speaks to Abraham concerning his generations, four generations from him, and how after those four generations, there's 400 years that God has already looked to and seen, and he gives an assurance that his descendants will come back to possess the land in which he's sleeping. He doesn't address the fact that there is no child. He just lets him know that what you are worrying about in this moment is nothing by comparison to what I have already seen concerning future generations that will be born from you. This is the same dream that, this is the same type of dreaming that God uses when he speaks to Jacob. When Jacob comes to the place called Luz, which he later changes to the name of Bethel, because it is at Bethel, at Luz, that God speaks to him. And he speaks to him again concerning his generations, concerning his descendants and how they will possess the land in which he's sleeping. And yet, like us, like me, Jacob wakes up and he's concerned to God despite all the big things that God is talking about. Jacob's chief concern is to say to God, if you would look after me, give me clothes to eat, uh, sorry, clothes to wear rather, clothes to wear and food on my back, then I will serve you. And again, it shows how it's easy for us when God is speaking in moments of grandeur, of big dreams, that we reduce him to the place of our need and confine him to the constraints of what we are going through. And so the, we, we, we must understand that because we are not caught up to live, we are not called by God to live for just 15 minutes in a lifetime. We're not live, caught up to, 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 to pursue 15 minutes of fame, but indeed the demand is that we have to be more. We have to be more impactful. We have to make a difference and, 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 and be culture creators. God then speaks to us, and, and, and as he does... One of the things that he unleashes in our lives is purpose. In, 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 over time, my thinkings around purpose have, have moved a little because many times we've set purpose as a destination, purpose as a place to which we are going. And yet when we read through scripture in one reading in particular that I will use for the purposes of this presentation, we see purpose is defined according to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28. He says, for we know that God causes all things to work together for good, for those that love him and are the core according to his purpose. So when God unleashes purpose, our thinking has to, to my mind, in my mind, my thinking around purpose had to shift because for years, purpose was always a destination. It was always a, a, a place to get to. And yet when we, when we read, for instance, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says that, for God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. The Greek word purpose there is the the word prothesis from which we get prosthesis or prosthetics and a prosthetic is typically in, in very loose definition is 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 a, a a piece of technology that is added to a body to enable it to function. Most commonly, we find that prosthetics are given where people have lost limbs, uh, whether uh, legs or, or arms, and a prosthesis is, is just that arm that, 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 that enabling them to, to, to find balance and functionality. It's an addition to the body. And so when God releases purpose in our lives, it's not so much for us to get to it, but it's to enable us to get to where God wants us to. Paul speaks of, I press on to the high calling of God in my life. And it's the prosthesis, the prothesis of God, the purpose of God that enables us to keep pressing on because we know that he is working all things together for our good. The word prothesis also is pictured in that particular context in the book of Romans as the table of showbread, the, 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 the loaves that were set on that table representing the idea that God by his purposes sets us on display to make known his mind to the world. And so when we're speaking of dreams, we are speaking of that level of, 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 of function where God is putting us on display. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10, Paul writes and says that for God has, desi has desired or decided, determined that the church is to make known his manifold wisdom to principality and power. So when we speak of the idea that human governments and uh, spiritual principalities are limited 
in their scope of understanding of what man is. God is using you and I as the church to display his manifold wisdom on so many different things. And so we now... So when we speak of process or rather purpose, we have to think in terms of mindfulness. It means, yes, living in the moment, but in the, living in the moment is about making the moments count. So it's, it's, it's not just saying that uh, uh, it, it's not the YOLO of this generation that you only live once and consequence be damned. But it's the idea that I, I, I'm aware that in this moment, this could be what God has called me to. And so I render myself, I am deliberate. I am intentional in every moment because I live every moment as if I am on assignment. We find that in the life of Joseph, even though he knew he had a dream, even though Joseph had dreamt these wonderful dreams as we've read um, in Scripture, Joseph never, when you actually look at his life pattern, Joseph never actually worked out or, or, or pushed for the fulfillment of his dream, but he lived it out by interpreting the dreams of others. And as the dreams of others came to being, Joseph's own dream materialized. He interpreted a dream for the cupbearer, where in, 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 in that season when he interpreted it, he expected, and many times this is what we do, he interpreted a dream for a man that would restore him to his function and, po and position in Pharaoh's court and he put his hopes in the fact that this man would remember him. May we stop waiting for people to speak well of us, knowing and trusting in God's seasoning and God's timing. And, and when God did remember Joseph, when God did remember Joseph, it was two full years after he had interpreted the cupbearer's dream. Why would that be? Is it possible that if Joseph had been released two years before, before Pharaoh had had his dream. Joseph would have been released from prison and instead of being in Egypt when God wanted him there, he would have made his way back to Canaan to be reunited with his family. May we trust God for the seasons of our lives, knowing that even though we don't see the manifestation and the fulfillment of what he has called us to just yet, of the things he has spoken to us, that we would be patient to wait and trust on his timing. Joseph interpreted the baker's dream. The baker's dream was not a pleasant dream, but the scripture told us that God was working on Joseph's character. Because if you and I are going to dream the kinds of dreams that shape nations and build systems, there are going to be seasons where we have to give some unpleasant interpretations to someone. And it's an, it's an issue of integrity of heart to just speak truth in love. Because when Joseph told that man that he had three days to live, that man was able to set the affair of his life in order. And so Joseph, even though he's giving bad news, is able to represent or present this man an opportunity to set up the affairs of his life as he's going to be terminated. And of course, Joseph then interprets Pharaoh's dream. It's in the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream that Joseph comes to the fulfillment of his own dream. And in interpreting Joseph's dream, our prayer, Pharaoh's dream rather, our prayers should be that we don't only interpret, but that we also are given strategies for implementation. Because in the interpretation of the dream, Joseph gave a strategy for implementation, and ultimately it was the implementation strategy that gave him promotion and access more than just the interpretation of a dream. And so... When we look at how all of this plays, David in his life is, 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 is called and he serves the dream of Jesse, his father looking after sheep. He, he serves the dream of Saul as a personal minister, as a general, a commander in the army. And, ultimate, and then he, when he connects with Samuel while fleeing from Saul, he serves Samuel's dream because it's Samuel who puts in Joseph's heart, in David's heart rather, the passion and the desire for the Ark of the Covenant, for the tabernacle of God. Together they organize and set what Solomon then builds as the order of worship in what we call Solomon's temple. David then, because of his desire for the manifestation of the kingdom in this way, was able to release and, and, and engage in wars that ensured territorial expansion and built a governmental order to live beyond himself as a setup for his son's fulfillment in the, what, he was, what he was being called to do. 
And so when we talk about the timings of a dream, to my mind then, when we talk about the timings of a dream again, the, the timing of a dream also requires that we be mindful that the time we have the dream may not be the same time as the fulfillment of the dream. So the context of where we are when we are dreaming, Joseph dreaming when he's a shepherd boy, Joseph dreaming when he is the second youngest of, of the 12 sons of Jacob, uh, and, and all he has is a, 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 a pastoral uh, lifestyle around him. He dreams a dream that the whole system around him interprets in the moment of the dream. And so rather than realize or recognize that God could be calling them to something greater, Joseph interprets his dream with an expectation that his brothers would bow down to him. His father even challenges him and says, do you think that your father, that me, your father, your mother, and your brothers will all bow down to you? And yet the time of the dream was while he was in a pastoral, uh, a shepherding environment. And yet the fulfillment of the dream comes when he is now in the palace. And the fulfillment of the dream was no longer just 12 shepherds bowing down to him, but it was entire nations where he had dreamt of the son being his father, the son that, doubt, that now bowed down to him was Pharaoh, where he had dreamt of the moon being his mother. It was an entire system of, 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 of Pharaoh's court, all of Pharaoh's aides that were now the moon that bowed down to Joseph. And when the 70 souls came into Egypt with with, with Jacob. It was nations that bowed down for him to feed and sustain. So you cannot judge. You and I cannot afford to live this moment to, to judge the dream that God has given us by the moment in which we are living. And so while we are working this process out, we then have to understand that when God speaks concerning dreams, in the last reference I'll use, he uses the book of Joel. He speaks to us in the book of Joel. And Joel says to us that, 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 that in, after these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And when we read the this things list, the, the, the things that are spoken of is the season of trial and affliction that Israel and Judah would be taken into. And then after that, there's a season of restoration where the canker worm and the palmer worm and the various locusts, uh, what was consumed by them, is restored. And then he says that after the affliction, after the, res the restoration, then I will pour out my spirit. And in that season, that's when your sons and daughters will prophesy. To, to prophesy is to, to speak um, by, by inspirations, to make known the mind of God. Throughout scripture, there's an application that, that connects this with, with a certain musicality. And so to, to, to prophesy has to do with the release of a sound. It's the release of a new song, the release of, 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 of something that gives inspiration. Saul prophesied also with the prophets and God gave him a new heart because there's something about speaking and releasing the sound of heaven that changes the condition of our heart. He says that your young men will see visions and the, see, the young men seeing visions means that they'll be able to formulate plans and ideas. Habakkuk says, write the vision and make it plain that they may run with it, that see it. And so the idea is that young men are then able to sort out and organize strategies and things that they see and deem are possible within their lives. But then he says that, and your old man will dream dreams. That he speaks to old men or speaks of old men dreaming dreams is not to distinguish and, and say that it is an activity of the frail, but it's to speak to the idea that old men, men who have come into a place of maturity, into a season of fullness of time and a fullness of life, are now able to see things beyond their lifetime that they begin to look into the future. They begin to see their sons. They see their children and their children's children. It was in a moment of dreaming in this kind of way that David sets in order the, the, the materials necessary for the building of the temple, but not only the materials necessary, he also puts in place the plan for the temple. He also puts in place with, Pharaoh, with, with Samuel's input, he puts in place the personnel to make the vision of the temple a reality. And so so old men dreaming dreams has to do with generations.
situations going beyond the place of my personal need, my personal ego, my personal satisfaction and the things that I'm chasing and reaching into the future towards the things that God has called me to. And so when we come to the level of dreams, one of the definitions or, or, or part of the explanation of what dreaming does, dreaming is to be restored to health. Dreaming restores and revives us to health. Why have I chosen to speak on this regard? Because in this season, I believe that as we are formulating and, and thinking, how will we emerge from a global pandemic and, and what next in our context as Zimbabwe with the many challenges that we've been facing for so many Many years, it becomes possible for people to live to a, for, to live for a moment, to live for for for, for the things that just define the, the the standard of of life, and not necessarily pursue the fullness of the quality of life. But ha, here God has sent to us as a generation; He's sent you and I as dreamers. And so now we declare to our cities, now we declare to our nation, we declare to our family, we declare to the continent. We declare to the world that out of the church, out of the kingdom of God is emerging a people, a generation of dreamers. I find it fascinating that after interpreting all of um, the king's dreams in the book of Daniel, Daniel himself begins to dream. And the chief theme of Daniel's dreaming is always the pursuit, the idea, the notion, the desire to know what will become of the people of God. And it is out of the book of Daniel that we find that he says that the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. It is out of the book of Daniel that Daniel says that the saints of the Lord shall take the kingdom and reign forevermore. So you and I have been called not to be conformed, limited by what we see in the world today, but to now begin to anticipate a level of dreams. Psalm 126. Uh, and so when uh, Psalm 126 says that when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. Because in the season when we speak of dreams, like Paul said in our earlier reading, we've been battered and bruised. We've gone through all manner of affliction. Yes, the intent was to keep us humble. But in the process, it's because there are things that you and I see in the realm of the Spirit. You and I dream for the sake of a nation. That when we begin to speak to people who don't read the Bible, Bible or understand scripture like you and I, who don't have the infilling of the Holy Ghost like you and I, that to them what we speak of sounds like a dream. It sounds far-fetched. It sounds crazy to believe that nations can be built with justice and truth as a foundation, with righteousness and peace as an aspiration and a reality that men and women walk into, that young men and young women will be able to live in, 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 in the kinds of life in, 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 that, that ensures that they that their generations are secure to ensure that health systems and schools and all of those things work not only to produce a mind but to produce the image and the nature of God and so there is this idea in psychology called belief perseverance that I want to leave with you belief perseverance is the tendency to cling to one's initial belief even after receiving new information that contradicts or disconfirms that basis of belief. That's why God then challenges us. He says that your young, your sons and daughters will prophesy. They'll speak the mind of God, something that's not consistent with the world in which they're living. They will, they will see visions. They will see a preferred future and not be content with the way things are today. And then they will dream dreams. They will imagine. They will come into, into a maturity that is beyond themselves and their immediate needs. And so three things I want to leave as a challenge for us today as the dreamers are being released all over this country. Number one, that you and I would work on producing a new sound. It can be a new song. It can be a new language. It can be a new word. But to choose to release a different sound, to have different conversations. John Acuff says that each one of us, every family, every individual, every organization, every company, every church, every nation has a soundtrack. 
It's time to change the soundtrack of our nation. It's time to change the soundtrack of our families. It's time to change the soundtrack of what we are doing. Number two, it's time for new sights, to see new things. There's a Latin expression that says, credendo vides, by believing one sees. It's time to compel our faith to make us see different things, not to be conformed, not to be content with what we see. We have to believe, we have to believe that what we are being called to, that this season, this moment, this time has been set as a reset for us to look and see things differently from the way we've always seen them. And then number three, new paths. Henry Cloud, a psychologist for pastors, says that every human being has a map. Every one of us navigates our world, whether it's our physical living space or in our spiritual and emotional and psychological space. Each one of us has a map that we use as a frame of reference. This, this, this map, as, according, as he puts it, is the same thing that allows blind people after a while to navigate their living spaces because they know where everything is. It's time for us to chart new territories. It's time for us to create new neural pathways, new ways and new systems of thought that ensure that when we manifest, the world will say, here come the dreamers. Here come those people that don't see things as they are. People that just don't make sense because what they talk about is far-fetched. May God bless you in this season. And so I pray now, I pray now as I conclude that God would grant you grace and favor. That God would cause you to dream and to aspire, to reach for things beyond your natural scope. That God would activate a faith in you that in this season as we've been pressing for seeing the kingdom, that God would manifest his power in you and help you to dream. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you.